Hello everyone, this is Mike Dowding with the SD Mines Physics Department and this is the first of a number of online lecture videos that we're going to use to get the course material to you over the next hopefully two weeks and then we'll be seeing each other again face to face in class. If not, we can always continue for the rest of the semester using this method. So what I have here is OneNote and I'm using a screen capture software that I'll then use to upload these videos to Wiley Plus. There's also a second video that I call the sliding pig and I did that as a test video a couple days ago and it seemed to work out fairly well. So you can also take a look at that if you want. It's based on, or rather it is one of your homework problems from chapter 6. Uh, it's a pretty in-depth problem but that's why I, I chose to use that as the example. So we're going to go ahead and expand this into full screen mode and as you can see today's topic is centripetal motion. This is the last topic that I have to cover at least for my course sections and so we'll start off by reminding ourselves about centripetal acceleration. This is the equation that you should recognize back in chapter 4 where if we had an object that was moving in a circle with a certain velocity and a radius of r, that object should then experience a centripetal acceleration, which is center seeking. Now if we combine that with the new material from chapter 5 and chapter 6, which F equals MA says if I apply a force to a mass it will accelerate. Or in the case of the object that we have that's moving in the circle, if it has mass and it's accelerating towards the center of that circle, then there has to be some corresponding centripetal force that is causing that motion to occur. And our job is to identify what that centripetal force is. Centripetal force is not going to be something new that we add to our list of forces. Uh, rather, we're going to have to figure out who's the culprit. And right now, our list of possible forces are gravity, tension, normal, and friction. So what we need to do is figure out are any of these capable of causing circular motion? And if the answer is yes, then we need to take the information about those forces and work them into our new version of Newton's second law where centripetal force equals MAC and then if we have to we can relate that back to the information that we had in chapter 4 about uniform circular motion that says AC equals V squared over R. So we're actually going to take our time today and go through all four of these case scenarios to see if any of them can in fact cause circular motion. And we may as well start at the top of the list with gravity. Now up to this point we've been using mg as the force of gravity on all of our objects. So say we had a mass of m that was some position above the ground 
the force of gravity acting on that mass would be mg and it would always be pointing down. Well, this is not going to cause circular motion to occur because we would need that gravity force to continuously point towards the center of some circular path. So that's not going to happen here on the surface of the Earth, but it could happen, say, somewhere above the surface of the Earth, like a satellite, which is traveling around the Earth. Because as we know, when one object orbits the other, there is a gravitational attraction between those two objects. So we're going to talk about the force of gravity in more detail because we know given that this satellite is moving around in a circle then there has to be some kind of centripetal acceleration acting on the mass of that satellite and we're going to go ahead and call that centripetal force F sub G but I'm not going to make the mistake of calling this mg because believe it or not even though we've been using 9.8 as the value for the acceleration due to gravity this is only valid at the surface of the earth as we get further and further away from the surface of the earth the acceleration due to gravity is going to change and so we need to look at why that is happening. And to do that, we're going to go back to our favorite physicist, Newton. And in addition to basically inventing calculus, Newton was also an astronomer. And he had years and years worth of astronomical data that was collected by astronomers that came before him and so anytime there was any kind of celestial object interacting with another celestial object there were some numbers floating around out there that Newton could get his hands on so what we have here are we'll just call them two planets uh, could be the Earth and the Moon, or we could use the, the Earth and the Sun. doesn't really matter at this point. What matters is that these two masses are going to be attracted to each other by some force of gravity. And Newton's third law states that for every force there has to be an equal and opposite counterforce and so these two gravity forces are actually of the same magnitude and what Newton found out was that the force of gravity between these two masses first of all depended on how much mass we were dealing with in the system so if one mass was larger we would get a larger gravity force. If the masses were smaller, we would get less gravity as a force. Another thing that Newton picked up on was that this magnitude of gravity force would diminish by the inverse squares relationship where R was the separation distance between the masses. Now a lot of people will make the mistake of just measuring between the two masses themselves. But in actuality, we need to use the center to center separation distance as the R value. And that'll, that'll come to make some sense when we look at our next example problem. 
Now the only thing left, there is a missing piece to this equation, the only thing left is what we call big G. And this is the universal gravity constant or universal constant of gravity. There's a lot of different names that I've heard big G given. And big G is a proportionality constant. Now where does big G come from? Well, remember Newton had all of this data available to him and as it turned out, for every conceivable combination of masses that were interacting with each other out there in space, the ratio of the gravity force to the mass and radius turned out to be the same value every single time. And that value was big G. It didn't matter what two masses he was working with. He kept getting the same value. And so he called that big G. That was his universal constant of gravity. And this value came out to be 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 11. Now there also needs to be some units that go with this and that's actually the easy part because when we look at the units on the left hand side, well we've got a force of gravity so units of force are newtons. Then we have to figure out what the units of big G are going to be. And we have two masses which will have units of kilograms and a radius value which is squared which means we'll have meters squared. Now we can do this the easy way or the hard way and I prefer the easy way with all things. I'm going to go ahead and combine those two kilograms right there. We're trying to find the units of this missing proportionality. The easiest way to do that is start over here on the left where we have Newtons and ask yourself are there any Newtons on the right hand side of the equality and at this point people try to start taking apart Newtons and you've got kilograms and meters and seconds but I say don't do that just keep the Newtons the way they are well, all we have are kilograms and meters on the right hand side. We don't have any newtons. So I'm going to put them in there. And that's it. And at this point your your math teacher is probably flipping out because first rule of algebra, what you do to one side you have to do to the other. Well, just hold on a second because we're going to do something else that shouldn't be done in math. Over here on the left I have Newtons, over here on the right I have Newtons and this extra stuff. Well, now that I have Newtons, I don't need this extra stuff anymore so I'll get rid of that. And to do that, I will multiply by the inverse. And we now have the units of our proportionality constant. So this is what we're going to use in our new force of gravity equation. The equation from up above should now look like this. And this is the equation for the force of gravity acting between the two masses that we have in our system. So two masses that we have in our system, we have the mass of the satellite and we have the mass of the Earth. We're only concerned right now with the force of gravity that's acting on that satellite, but that's okay because as we said up above with Newton's third law, 
it has to be the same magnitude of force for each. Well, that means we've got a little bit of updating that we have to do with this equation. The two masses involved are going to be the mass of the Earth and the mass of the satellite divided by the separation distance. And here's where that center to center measurement becomes important because most people would just measure the altitude of the satellite above the Earth and they would completely forget about the fact that we also have the radius of the Earth. So the radius of the circle that our satellite is orbiting around needs to be the radius of the Earth plus whatever altitude above the surface that satellite is sitting at. And that will be our R squared value down here. Okay, so we have a new gravity equation for what's happening to the mass of our satellite. What do we do with it? Well, we've already identified the fact that this gravity force is pointing towards the center of our circle. And so that means that we have identified our centripetal force. Our centripetal force in this case was the gravity force. We know from chapter 4 and chapter 5 that the centripetal acceleration is equal to b squared over r. And so we're going to use that. Oops. Looks like I got some kind of cosmic highlighter here, but that's appropriate. We're going to use that fact to put these two equations equal to each other and see what we get out of this. Now our centripetal motion equation says mv squared over r, but which m are we talking about? Is this the mass of the Earth, the mass of the satellite? Is it some third mass? Well, that's easy enough to answer because when it comes to centripetal motion, the mass involved is the one that's doing the circular motion. So in this case, we have mass of the satellite. You may also see that we have R values on either side. Are those the same R values? Because over here, R is the center to center separation between the two masses. Whereas over here, R is the radius of the circle that the satellite is traveling. And as it turns out, those are the same R values. And so we can factor out both the mass of the satellite and one of the R values. And what is left is a pretty important relationship when it comes to orbiting bodies. We have GME over R equals V squared. And if we take the square root of each side, we get an expression that tells us how fast an orbiting mass has to be traveling at a given radius in order for it to remain in orbit. Now, the consequence of any square root is a plus or minus. For right now, we're just concerned with the magnitude of the velocity, but that plus or minus actually does play an important part in this because we have a choice. We can orbit counterclockwise or we can orbit clockwise. And depending on which way you're orbiting, 
that's what the plus or minus on our square root is indicating. But like I said, we're just interested in the absolute value. And so there we have it. So that's gravity as a centripetal force. We took our new and improved gravity equation. This is the equation that we're going to have to use anytime we are not on the surface of the Earth, including if we go to the surface of any other planets. We're going to have to use this equation to help us figure out what the acceleration due to gravity is. But now that we know that, now that we know what our gravity force is, we can set that equal to MAC. And we now know how to deal with gravity as a centripetal force. So next we will try tension. Can tension be used as a centripetal force? Well, at some point we've all probably taken something that was tied to a string and swung it around in a circle. So the answer to that is yes. We can in fact take a mass, spin it around in a circle, and while it's tied to a string, there will be a centripetal acceleration, which means that there will be a centripetal force. And that centripetal force is going to be tension. And if you remember from some of our class discussions, tension is always going to pull away from the point of contact. Well, that's the only direction that the rope can pull on the mass is towards the center of the circle. So yes, our tension will be the centripetal force for this system. Well, that was way quicker than trying to derive the force of gravity. So is that it? Are we done? Well, now we start doing things with this. We remember that a sub c equals v squared over r. So there will be some speed with, with which this mass is being spun around in a circle. And r will relate to the length of the rope that is being spun around. So let's try an example problem with this. Let's say that you have a one meter length of rope. So that's going to be the R value. We take a mass of two kilograms, tie that to the rope, and we start spinning the rope in a horizontal circle. So what we have here is uh, an overhead view. We're looking down onto a tabletop and we're swinging this mass around in a circle over the top of a frictionless surface. And this rope has a rating on it. it says that the maximum tension that this rope can apply is, uh, let's do 50 newtons. So I'm not, I'm not sure if this is a rope or a string at this point, but the numbers will tell us. With that in mind, what is the maximum speed with which our mass can travel around the circle? So that's the problem. Well, to figure that out, we'll take the equation that we came up with above, and we'll start applying what we know. We say tension equals m v squared over r. We're told that 
The rope can only withstand 50 newtons, otherwise I'm assuming it's going to break. And since we're looking for the maximum speed, we may as well just allow the tension itself to max out. At this point it's algebra. We're going to rearrange our equation to solve for V max. And as we do that, we get T max R over M square root. Again, we get a plus or minus, but all that means is that if I swing this mass too fast in one direction, the rope will break. And if I spin it in the other direction too fast, the rope will break. Well, now we're pretty much done. All we need to do is plug in our numbers. We have T max of 50. We have R of 1. We have mass of 2. And I didn't even intend this to happen, but it's working out very well. We have square root 25, which is, whoops, 5. So if I swing this rope any faster than 5 meters per second, it will break. If I swing the rope any slower than that, then it should be fine. Because anything less than 5 meters per second will result in a tension force that is less than the 50. Well, that's for a, a horizontal circle. What if we have a vertical circle? So now we have a rope and a mass. Except now we're dealing with a vertical system with gravity pointing down and I want to know something about the tension force in this rope at different locations because as we achieve different locations traveling around this circle we're going to get different tension forces. And so we'll, we'll see what we mean by that. One thing that I want to do for this particular problem is I want to maintain the idea of uniform circular motion. And this definition from chapter 4 said that the velocity will remain constant the radius will remain constant, and as such, the centripetal acceleration will, main, will remain constant. So regardless of where the mass is, it has the same velocity of V as it's traveling around the circle, and it has the same radius everywhere, and that means we'll always have the same centripetal acceleration pulling towards the center of the circle. So does that mean that the tension is constant? Well, let's find out. I'm going to clean this up just a little bit. I'll get rid of these R's and the acceleration term so that I have something to write with. And we're going to look at all four of these positions. We have the right hand side, the top, the left, and the bottom. And I'm interested in what the, the tension force is going to be at those four locations. So we'll start at the right hand side. And at the right hand side we have, let's see, I'll use this orange. We have gravity which is pulling down, and we have tension, 
that is pulling towards the center of the circle. So that's the direction of our centripetal acceleration. And I'm going to do myself a favor and assign a reference frame that will line up with all of the vectors that I have for this particular picture. Because what I want to do now is look at the sum of forces acting on our mass. So in the x direction, x direction being towards the center of the circle, we have the tension force and, well, that's it. So the tension force has to equal the centripetal force, which is equal to mv squared over r. And I'm just going to leave that for a moment. I'm not going to worry about the, the summation of forces in the y direction because the tension force is not in the y direction when we're looking at the mass over here. However, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the the top location. What happens when our mass gets up to the, the top location? And let's see what color. I'll use purple for this one. When we get up to this top location, we have the tension force that is pulling towards the center of the circle, but we also have gravity pulling towards the center of the circle. And this is an interesting outcome because now for the centripetal acceleration, I have both forces acting in the positive y direction. So for the top, we have the sum of forces in the y direction that says tension and gravity are responsible for the centripetal acceleration of the mass. And so what does that mean for the tension force itself? Because basically what we're doing is comparing the tension force at different locations in the circle. At the right hand side, tension was just equal to mv squared over r. But now, when the mass gets to the top, the tension is equal to mv squared over r minus mg. So even though we're, we're still traveling with a constant velocity around this circle, our tension force has reduced because it's actually being aided by gravity pulling down towards the center of the circle. Well, next we're going to move over to the, the left-hand side. And as you can probably tell now, the left-hand picture is really not going to look much different from the right-hand picture. We have tension pulling towards the center in the same direction as the acceleration. We have the weight pointing down in a completely different direction. And so the, the tension on the left side of the circle is just going to be the same as what it was over on the right side of the circle. That just leaves us with the bottom. Oops. What is the tension at the bottom of the circle? Well, at the bottom of the circle, we have weight pointing down. We have tension pulling up towards the center of the circle in the same direction as the centripetal acceleration. 
And if we put all that together into a sum of force expression, um, we, we can use the same reference frame if you want. We just have to be careful because, let's see, mg minus t has to equal the mass times the acceleration, which is technically pointing in the negative direction with respect to our reference frame. And I'm not a fan of that notation, so what I'm going to do is just carry the minus sign through to the other side and call that good. But that means that the tension at the bottom equals mac, which is v squared over r, plus mg. So we're getting a much larger tension at the bottom of the circle. We're getting a much smaller tension at the top of the circle. And then we have, I guess we could say, regular tension at the left and right hand sides. So that's tension as a centripetal force. And we've got two more to consider. Let's see where they're at. What did we have left? There was normal and the friction force. So we'll come over. Oops. And we'll consider normal force. Now the normal force is the force which points normal to the surface of contact. And we've been using this whenever we have a mass that is in contact with a surface. So in the case of a, a block that's sitting on a flat tabletop, the mass of the block pushes down into the table, so the table has to push back with an equal and opposite amount of force. If we put all of that, oops, if we put all of that into a sum of forces, then we would find that the normal force equals the weight. Uh, we could also put the, the block onto an incline plane, in which case the normal force would become mg cosine. So you can go back and check your notes on that. So can a normal force act as a centripetal force? In other words, is it possible to have something moving in a circle subject to a normal force? And the answer is yes. Uh, what we want to consider is a loop-to-loop. So sometimes you'll have a, a daredevil on a bike that wants to ride through this loop-to-loop. -loop. And as they ride through that loop-to-loop, -loop, the bike is pressing against the track while the track pushes back on the bike. So I'm going to just pretend that this block here is the bike as it's traveling around this vertical circle. And at any given time, the orientation of the bike, as the bike presses into the track, the track has to push the bike back. So every time the track pushes the bike, that's a normal force, but the direction that the normal force is pushing in each case is towards the center of the circle. So yes, the normal force can act as a centripetal force, but there's a little more to that. If we look back at the 
equation involving tension, we saw that the tension force, it wasn't just equal to the centripetal force in every case. Sometimes the tension force depended on both centripetal and gravity. Well, is that going to be the case with the normal force? Is the normal force just equal to the centripetal force? Or is it going to be equal to some other stuff as well? Well, I think you can see from the uh, comparisons between this and the tension example, uh, the answer is going to be yes. Gravity is going to play a part in this. So what I'll do is I'll very quickly look at what is happening at each of these locations. Because in each case we have centripetal acceleration pointing towards the center of the circle. And at each of those locations so right, left, top, bottom, we want to know what the normal force is. Uh, let's go ahead and start with the bottom, just because that's the, the most complete picture that we have right here. So there's the bottom case. I'll go ahead and use the same reference frame. Or I'm sorry, that's not the same reference frame, but traditional reference frame. I have the normal force pointing up. I have the weight pointing down. Those two are responsible for getting together and accelerating the mass as it travels around the circle. But that's equal to mv squared over r, which means that the normal force at the bottom of the track is equal to mv squared over r plus mg. So what about at the top of the track? So up here at the top of the track, well we've got the normal force pointing down, we've got the centripetal acceleration pointing down, don't forget gravity also pointing down. That means the sum of forces at the top of the track. Um, I'm going to go ahead and flip my reference frame over for this, just so I don't have a bunch of negatives. But this says normal force, weight, and the centripetal acceleration are all pointing in the same direction. And if I rearrange this for my normal force, I get mv squared over r minus mg. And this is kind of an important realization. When I get to the bottom of the track, I not only feel the weight, but I feel the additional centripetal force, which means I'm going to feel really heavy at the bottom of the track as opposed to at the top of the track, I'm going to feel the weight pulling down, but the centripetal force being in an opposing direction, I'm going to feel very light at the top of the track. And this goes hand in hand with the last time that you were on a roller coaster. If you think the last time you were on a roller coaster and you got to the bottom of the track, you've probably felt very, very heavy. Whereas when you were coming over the peak, you probably felt very, very light. And that's a very, very similar thing as to what's happening over here with the normal force. Now, we still have the left and the right hand sides, but we can get away with just talking about one of them because just like the tension force, we're going to reproduce the same outcome. The only thing that's missing from either of these is the gravity force, but as you can see, the gravity force is not in the same direction as the normal force or the centripetal acceleration. 
as such if I try producing a sum of forces in the X direction I have the normal force and that's it so the normal force is responsible for the centripetal acceleration which means the normal force is equal to mv squared over r and we compare that to the top or the bottom of the track so I guess we could say we we feel regular normal force at the right and left sides of the track so this is almost identical to the outcome that we had for the tension forces we had a very high tension force at the bottom of the swing we had a very small tension force at the top of the swing and then we had a regular sized tension force at either side well what's left friction can friction be used as a centripetal force and if you've ever driven in icy conditions the answer to that is I hope so if you think about the last time the roads were really icy and you had to drive your car through a turn did your car actually turn or did you just continue going in the same direction as before and again that all depends on how how slippery the conditions were but a lot of times you'll you'll try to turn your tires one way and the vehicle just continues going in the other direction and that has to do with the fact that your tires cannot grip the surface well enough and it's that interaction between your tires and the surface of the road which tell us something about friction in other words is there a static friction force or a kinetic friction force that is helping us to stay along this uniform circle and that that's the key statement here we want uniform. We want the speed to stay uniform. We want the radius to stay uniform. So we want the acceleration to stay uniform. And I always ask this question of my students. I say we need we need some kind of centripetal force that's going to keep us moving in the circle. And well, gravity's not going to do it there's no ropes or anything um, the car the car is not pressing up against a surface that would give me any kind of normal force so normal force isn't going to do it I guess friction is the only force that's left question is which one is it the static friction or the kinetic friction force which is providing us with this centripetal force and I'll give you a, a couple of seconds to think that over so now we want to decide is it static friction or kinetic friction that keeps us moving in this circular path and anytime I ask this question in class the, the distribution of votes is usually about 5% to 95% and if you said kinetic friction you're thinking oh I got it right well sorry actually you didn't because the force that is keeping you moving in a circle is the static friction force and you're probably thinking well what the heck static friction means you're supposed to remain static you're not supposed to be moving 
And what are we doing here? Well, we're moving in a circle. That is true. But, but what I want you to consider is, are you moving in this direction? The whole point of having friction move us in a circle was so that we could maintain a uniform radius. In other words, are you static along the radial direction? And in this case, yes. I want the vehicle to remain at a static radius. Otherwise, if I don't, that means the car is either sliding into the circle or sliding out of the circle, which in this case it's really bad because that means you've lost control of the vehicle. So we actually need the static friction as our centripetal force. There will still be some kinetic friction in the system, but that's going to be occurring in the direction opposite of the motion. And that is not something that we're considering at the moment. We're just interested in what is going to keep us from losing control of our vehicle. And so that has to be the static friction force. Now there are two forms of static friction. You have the static friction that keeps everything from moving around and that is equal to whatever the counter applied force is versus the maximum static friction force which can be calculated using our static coefficient and normal force. Now this is by far the more important of the two equations because when you're driving in these dangerous slippery conditions, what most people want to know is how fast can I take that turn without losing control. So if I want to maximize the velocity, that means that I probably need to maximize the static friction of the system. So let's try another example problem. We'll get ourselves a, a new circle to work with here. So you have a car that is traveling with a velocity of V and we'll say that that's 20 meters per second around a radius of We'll make that 15 meters. Um, actually, let's let's start over. We'll go ahead and keep the 15 meters, but I'm going to put a static coefficient of 0.1. So this this would this would be uh, a description of the conditions of the road. Uh, this is going to measure how much grip there is between the tires and the road. So if it's icy out, this coefficient is going to be much lower. And what I want to know is what will be the maximum velocity that we can take this turn without losing control of the vehicle. Now typically you're not out there spinning cookies like this. You're you're probably only working with like a quarter circle. And this, this would be the same as if you were traveling through an intersection, turning left. So if that intersection had a radius of 15 meters and these are the conditions of the road at the time. How fast can you take that turn? That's what we want to know. And just in case you're wondering, the mass of your car is M, which we can make that a thousand kilograms. 
I know that's a pretty heavy car, but you probably want your car to be heavy if you're driving around in the snow and ice. All right, here we go. The static friction force is going to be our centripetal force. And since we want to max out our velocity, that means we want to max out the static friction. So we're going to max out our velocity here. All right, that gives us an equation for what the maximum static friction has to equal, but where's our maximum static friction value coming from? Well, that's coming from right over here. And that means we need to know what the normal force is. Okay, normal force. Well, we already said the, the vehicle itself is not pressed up against any kind of wall. Instead, we need to consider a slightly different view. So over here we have the overhead view of the car as it's traveling in a circle. And over here I'm going to put a side view. Oops, side, side. Side view. So right here will be the center of the circle. Here we have the radius of the circle. And here we have the car. Um, it's going to be traveling into the board. So I guess here you can see its brake lights as it's traveling into the page. But the reason I'm drawing it like this is so that I can see how the vehicle is interacting with the ground. If it's a flat surface, then gravity points down, normal force points up, and our static friction force needs to be pointing towards the center of our circle. In other words, it has to point in the direction of the radius. This tells us what our sum of forces in the y direction is going to be. In other words, the normal force is equal to mg. I'm going to plug that into our equation for maximum static, which is now equal to mg times the coefficient and that will get plugged in over here. We now have the maximum static friction, mu s m g, equal to m v max squared over r squared, and oh look at that. We didn't even need to know what the mass of the vehicle was. The mass of the vehicle has canceled out well, hold on, I thought we said we wanted a heavy vehicle because that helps us in the winter time. Well, sorry, that's a myth. Having more weight in your vehicle is not going to help you from losing control as you take a turn. What having the extra weight in your vehicle does is it helps you in overcoming uh, friction along the drive direction. It's what helps you get uh, enough grip with your tires to propel you forward, but it's not going to help you in uh, losing control of your vehicle if you turn too sharp. So this means we have a maximum velocity of mu s r squared. Um, let's see, is that correct? Yep, looks like it. Um, need the square there. And so what do we have now? We have V max equals root mu s r. Um, 
for some reason that doesn't look right, but I'm not seeing any errors in the math at the moment. Well, let's see what we get out of this, because we said that we had a radius of 15 meters, we had a coefficient of 0.1, so we need root of 0.1 times 15. I'm going to grab my trusty calculator here to see what that gives us. Well, I guess this is coming out okay. I'm getting about 4.74 meters per second as the maximum velocity through that intersection. Now that velocity can be changed if we change either the radius. So if we were to take this turn at a larger radius, then we could take the turn at a larger speed or if we improve the conditions of the road. In other words, get rid of the ice, um, dry the road, put some salt down, something like that. Um, and that would also allow us to increase the speed at which we could take that turn. All right, well, I appreciate you all sticking through this to the end, assuming you are still watching. Uh, we've covered a lot today. In fact, probably more than we would have been able to cover in a single lecture period. But we've now seen how all four of these forces can be used as a centripetal force. What I would like you to take away from this is the possibility of using more than one of these in a single problem as some combination of centripetal force. In other words, could you take the car traveling in a circle and place that car on an incline? Because this is what you have happening in cases like NASCAR. They will, they will place an extreme incline and make use of that normal force to help push the vehicle towards the center of a circle in addition to uh, friction forces that work um, in the direction of the incline itself. So it is possible to have more than one of these show up in the same problem relating to a centripetal system. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it at that. Um, please go back, rewind, uh, recheck certain sections of this video as you need to. And as always, if you have any questions, you can contact me, your course instructor, or any of the physics graduate TAs. So have a good day. I'll see you in the next video.